But I think a lot of what we do is to be like someone we admire or individuals we admire, and that's what prompted that decision. There are very, very bright people in the world who don't see it at all the same way uh, that I do or that many in uniform do. Uh, people who don't seem to see the world the same way you do can still be exceedingly bright yeah. uh, and exceedingly well informed. Cyber war, uh, do, like, do you see that coming? <laughs> Well, clearly cyberspace is a new entire domain of warfare without question. Life is an endless stream of challenges, but no worries. Manoj is bringing the world's best minds right here for you. My gosh, Manoj, you just blew my mind. Thank you, universe. Manoj, thank you. I'm so grateful. It makes me feel a little bit better. Thank you. Bootstrapping Your Dreams is here to give you what you need to succeed. Hello and welcome to this new episode of Bootstrapping Your Dreams Show. Today we have a very special guest, General David Petraeus. So those of you who don't know General Petraeus, uh, he has served in the U.S. military for 37 years, including tours in Cold War Europe, United States, Central America, Haiti, Bosnia, Kuwait, Iraq, Afghanistan, and the greater Middle East. He culminated his military service with six consecutive commands as a general officer, five of which were in combat, including command of the 101st Airborne Division Air Assault during the fight to Baghdad, and the first year in Iraq, Multinational Security Transition Command Iraq over 15 subsequent months, Multinational Force Iraq during the surge from February 2007 to September 2008, U.S. Central Command from 2008 to 2010, and the International Security Assistance Force in Afghanistan from 2010 to 2011. General Petraeus graduated with distinction from the U.S. Military Academy, subsequently earned a PhD from Princeton University, and has held academic appointments at six universities. Uh, he has received numerous U.S. military, State Department, NATO, and U.N. medals, including four Defense Distinguished Service Medals, the Bronze Star Medal for Valor, and the Combat Action Badge, and he has been decorated by 13 foreign countries. Following his service in the military, General Petraeus served as the director of the CIA, leading the agency through a period that saw significant achievements in the global counterterrorism effort, development of a strategic plan for the agency, and an initiative to increase worldwide human intelligence coverage. General Petraeus joined KKR in June 2013 as chairman of the KKR Global, global Institute. He went on to become a partner at KKR in December 2014, the Global Institute supports the KKR investment process and KKR's portfolio companies with analysis of geopolitical, macroeconomic, environmental, social, and governance issues. General Petraeus is also a member of the board at, of directors at successful companies like Optave and OneStream. Uh, General Petraeus is also a successful venture capitalist himself, a visiting fellow at Yale University's Jackson Center and an honorary professor of international security at the University of Birmingham. Birmingham, England. Uh, that was, uh, I'm sure, uh, just a, a small introduction to the illustrious uh, career you had. Well, welcome so uh, much, uh, General Petraeus. I'm so excited to have you on my podcast. The pleasure is mine, Manish. Thank you. Awesome. So, uh, you know, generally we start off by learning more about your life, your career, but you've had such a long, uh, impactful career. Um, can you just recall a few incidents which may have had like, uh, you know, a significant uh, impact on your, the direction of your career, any mentor you met, any meetings, chance meetings that you had. So something, something that you recall, which had a, a significant impact on your career. Well, first was just choosing to go to the U.S. Military Academy at West Point, which happened yeah. to be seven miles from my hometown. Uh -huh. And the truth is, when I look back on that, I think I wanted to be like those uh, whom I saw who were associated with West Point, the graduates, the cadets who were there, uh, those who were on the faculty and staff, uh, the coach of our high school soccer team had actually coached the West Point team, in fact, to the national championship, and we won a, a, a county championship in our senior year. Uh -huh. uh, I had professors. Uh, former professors from West Point who taught me math and a variety of other subjects. And I think at least half of the people to whom I delivered a newspaper in my morning newspaper route for two and a half years, again, were West Point graduates or those who were serving at West Point at the time. And I realized that I admired uh, what they represented, and that's what led me to go to West Point. I think a lot of what we do is 
to be like someone we admire or individuals mm -hmm. we admire. And that's what prompted that decision. That's and then I stayed in the military because I enjoyed the mix that it provided of, you know, very physical activity. I did enjoy very much the physical component of being an infantry officer, a paratrooper, an air assault trooper, ranger, and all the rest of this stuff. Um, you had these very challenging, again, endeavors along the way, such as airborne school and ranger school and air assault mm -hmm. school and all the rest of that. But on the other hand, you know, about the time that you're a little bit tired of the rucksack biting into your shoulders after three or four years with uh, soldiers in a unit, uh, you'd have an opportunity to do something like go to Princeton for a couple of years or, uh, you know, be in the outer office of the chairman of the Joint Chiefs or the Supreme Allied Commander of Europe or the Chief of Staff of the Army, uh, these kinds of things. So I loved that combination of the very significant emphasis on physical uh, capability, uh, believe strongly in leading from the front. As we used to say, it's hard to lead if uh, if you're in the back of the formation. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and But also the fact that, I mean, there's a significant intellectual component to soldiering and certainly to the making of strategy and operational concepts uh, and tactical uh, design and so forth. Um, and then that there was also this academic opportunity along the way at different times. And, and I was very fortunate to be able to go down the road less traveled on a number of occasions. Mm -hmm. um, you know, instead of going to the infantry advanced course as a captain, I went to the armor course. And I, in fact, I did the infantry one by correspondence ahead of time nice. so that I could say, excuse me, I've already been to that course. I don't need, I'd like to go to this other one just for the different experience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I went instead of going to the war college, I went to a, a fellowship at Georgetown University in Washington. Uh, and instead of completing that, I spent the spring semester uh, abroad, if you will. I was the force chief of force operations for the United Nations force in Haiti, not a U.S. position, a United mm -hmm. Nations officer position. And again, throughout my career, I had those opportunities, including, again, uh, civilian graduate school, which was a tremendous out of my intellectual comfort zone experience mm -hmm. uh, and one from which I learned a great deal, not just about uh, political philosophy and international relations theory and economics uh, theory and so forth, but also about communication skills, critical analysis, and the sheer fact that there are very, very bright people in the world who don't see it at all the same way uh, that I do or that many in uniform do. I, and I went there from being at the staff college and, you know, we thought we had these fierce debates, but they were about differences that were like this compared mm -hmm. with the differences at grad school. Uh, and, and again, a very, very salutary experience. And when people ask me, you know, what was it that seemed to prepare you for what you've done in Mosul in Northern Iraq as a two-star general commander of the 101st Airborne Division, and the occupation force commander for that part of the country. So therefore you are the executive branch, the legislative and the judicial all in one. There is no Iraqi authority. Um, you know, I, as I thought about it, certainly it was experiences in Central America and Haiti and Bosnia for a year. Uh, it was the dissertation on the impact of Vietnam and military thinking about the use of force. It was all these other uh, self-study and reading and everything else. but. But a lot of it was I'd just been at this civilian institution, which challenged me so significantly and made me realize that, again, uh, people who don't seem to see the world the same way you do can still be exceedingly bright yeah. uh, and exceedingly well informed. And that's certainly what we found in northern Iraq, especially in Mosul, which was such a, you know, it's literally the fault lines of all the different civilizations. That's where they all came together and and went back and forth a bit the same way that you have that in the Balkans uh, in Southern Europe, mm -hmm. uh, Southeastern Europe. Uh, but you had, you know, Christian civilization, Turkmen, you had Kurds, you had Arabs, you had Sunni and Shia, yeah. um, you had Shabak, you had Yazidi. Again, all of this in that one province of Nainawa, the capital of which was Mosul. And I think again, because I'd had to deal with people from all over the world as well, by the way, in the program of public and international affairs at Princeton. Uh, but just in a recognition that, you know, there again, there's some very, very bright folks who just come at the 
the problems, the issues from a different perspective. Yeah. Um, and by the way, we may not be right all the time. Yeah, that's great. Uh, that's a unique perspective. So it sounds like, uh, you know, you did not shy away. In fact, you actually welcomed the challenges of the unknown and, and that led to a humongous growth and also getting the perspective of people who may not think like you or may have a different opinion about things. Very much so. And I, I also think that there's a lot to be said for, in a sense, publicly committing yourself to a particular goal or objective that, you know, you might curse yourself ever <laughs> after that until you actually achieve that goal. And there were num numerous such examples for me. But for example, when I was at the staff college, I told my staff, the professor who was in charge of our group of, of staff group members, I said, look, this is the year that I'm going to run a marathon in well under three hours. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you have to really up your mileage. You have to do speed work. You have to train, obviously, a very considerable amount of time. And I was really wondering why in the world did I ever do that? Uh, what was I thinking? Uh, and but ultimately, I ran a two hour, 50 minute and 50 second marathon and, and um. obviously felt pretty good about that. And I wouldn't have done that had it not been that I just put down this, in a sense, public marker. In other words, I told someone else that this was what I was going to do. When I went to graduate school, West Point sends you to graduate school so you can get a master's degree to teach at West Point, which is the requirement. And I told my future uh, boss at West Point in the Department of Social Sciences, I said, look, I am, I'm gonna try to get not just the master's degree, but all the coursework done for the PhD all the general exams, the oral exam, and the dissertation prospectus and the language exam, all of that approved before I leave Princeton, keeping in mind that this was pre-email, pre-internet days. And so once you left, it was very difficult back and forth to, to have the kind of exchange that we enjoy with those at academic institutions now, especially with yeah. Zoom and MS Teams and WebEx and so forth. So. And again, as that two year period, which was supposed to be this really relaxed, wonderful time, uh, we also had a one year old uh, daughter, uh, you know, that was going to be the time where you dial it down after you've been to troops for a long period. Uh, and it ended up being a very, very challenging period, but ultimately, you know, got it done uh, and then got the dissertation done, even though I only had two instead of three years at West Point because I got pulled out a year early. You asked about mentors, in fact, and I should note that I was fortunate to have some incredible mentors over the year, and they played pivotal roles. The, the most important one of those was a, a general named Jack Galvin. I first served for him when I was his aide, when he was a two-star general and a division commander. And I remember as we were approaching the end of our time together, um, he asked me, he said, Dave, have you ever thought about whether you might want to elevate your, your intellectual sights beyond the maximum effective range of an M60 machine gun. And, you know, and the idea being that, of course, an infantry unit is the longest range of an infantry company, at least at that time, uh, was its heavy machine or its medium machine gun. Of course, you had some mortars and artillery, but again, that's what we controlled. And it was a bit tongue in cheek that he said that, but I got the point. And in fact, that led to a really pretty substantial decision where I'd been wanting to go to the ranger regiment and instead i decided to go to graduate school uh he had a huge imprint uh on my life he pulled me out of west point between the first and second years to go down and be a special assistant for him uh in central and south america where he was the commander in chief of you uh, the u.s southern command and then when he was named the nato supreme allied commander he pulled me out of west point entirely out of the final year uh, which meant I really had to sprint to finish the dissertation before leaving because I've been planning to have a research semester the final year. But again, it all worked out really well. And it was an extraordinary experience to be a speechwriter for the NATO Supreme Allied Commander during the first year. And it happened to be the year of the Intermediate Nuclear Force Agreement. So there was a lot of interaction with the, with the White House, uh, with all of the other major uh, NATO nations, capitals and prime ministers and presidents. Uh, and it was just an extraordinary experience uh, to be doing that for someone like that. And I, and I continued. Uh, we were friends uh, for life, really. And in fact, I was the one who gave the eulogy at his funeral eventually uh, before he was buried at Arlington National Cemetery. 
And there were others along the way as well. There's a General Jack Keane, often seen on Fox News, who was a tremendous mentor. He was literally standing next to me. He was a one-star general. I was a lieutenant colonel when I got shot through the chest uh, in a live fire exercise. Uh, very aggressive. He loved that we were so aggressive, but it meant that we took risk. And by gosh, um, this mistake by a soldier led to an accidental discharge when his weapon was pointed back in our direction after knocking out a bunker with a grenade. So um, it provided great battlefield realism training for our medics, needless to say, because they really did have to employ oh, yeah. the life-saving steps as their turn and plug a sucking chest wound and get a, an IV going and all the rest of that. But again, and, and, and many, many others. Uh, I was privileged to work for as chief of staff of the Army, Carl Bono, from whom I learned a great deal about just sheer emphasis on the big ideas, relentless, uh, never-ending repetition of those ideas. Uh, of uh, a, a chairman of the Joint Chiefs, uh, General Hugh Shelton, for whom I served as a colonel for two years, uh, is sort of his sort of chief of staff, if you will, or executive officer was the term, uh, during a period that included the Kosovo air campaign, strikes against uh, Saddam Hussein, strikes against Osama bin Laden, uh, deployment to Kuwait to counter Saddam, and on and on, just an extraordinary period. Uh, and again, those vantage point positions are hugely developmental, needless to say. And, and there were many others. Uh, again, uh, those in the 82nd Airborne Division, uh, where I was privileged to command a brigade uh, and, and so forth. General Dan McNeil, who um, was my three star boss, but was already in Afghanistan when we were going off to war in Iraq and, and who had a very sage bit of advice about knowing which brigade you want to be the main effort way in advance so that you can position the forces uh, in a way that will ensure that you have the option of that brigade combat team being the main effort when it's needed. Uh, and again, individuals that sort of rhetorically and sometimes physically put their arm around your shoulder and, uh, and pointed something out to you quietly um, and, and inspired you and, and provided an example uh, to which we could aspire to to emulate. That's amazing. Um, that's amazing. And and uh, you know, I, I never heard that uh, story. The you you getting shot that must be a surreal experience. And I want to yeah, it was, uh, yeah, it was but... a near death experience. Trust me. And um, and ultimately, the really interesting fact from that was that the individual who ultimately did surgery on me, ultimately I ended up at Vanderbilt University Medical Center after a stop at the post hospital at Fort Campbell, Kentucky. Mm -hmm. uh, that was none other than Dr. Bill Frist, who within a few years would be a Senator Bill Frist, and then within a few years of that ended up as the majority leader, uh, Bill Frist. In oh. fact, when I was commanding the 101st Airborne Division in Iraq, Mm -hmm. uh, it was very helpful to us because he pushed forward on some initiatives uh, that we raised to him when he came out to visit Iraq uh, and really was a terrific individual. Uh, so again, lots of those kinds of stories. That's great. And um, yeah, I mean, uh, th that's uh, what I wanted to ask. Like, uh, you know, uh, military is, is, is famous for sort of breaking you down as a person, building you, rebuilding you up in, in their image. But um, you know, going into combat, going into real uh, uh, field uh, is is very different from learning on the job. So did you uh, find any any lessons that you learned or anything that you recall that was quite different in the field than what you learned in the academy? Oh, I mean, there are innumerable lessons. The, you know, the first is, frankly, the fact that there are real casualties in real combat. Yeah. Um, and when those calls come in, I'll never forget the very first radio calls uh, on a tactical satellite radio that we just lost a soldier. Yeah. Uh, and then that we had vehicles knocked out. And then that we, you know, again, and it just obviously it continues to accumulate. Yeah. Uh, I remember eavesdropping on a fellow division commander's radio because they were to our front and they were the ones doing the thunder run into Baghdad. And hearing the stories back about M1 main battle tanks being knocked out by surges of, of fighters, uh, paramilitary almost, uh, on the highways leading into Baghdad. Um, again, this is, you know, it's, it's no longer exercise. This is not, uh, we're not playing at war here. This is for real. Uh, 
Yeah. And yeah. real people actually yeah. get seriously injured, uh, seriously wounded and dead. Uh, and obviously that is something that one has to learn how to deal with, obviously trying to do everything you can to mitigate the risks, always to reduce the possibility of that. I remember before our very first big fight uh, on the fight to Baghdad, which was to take the city of Najaf, which yeah. is the holiest city in Shia Islam, had a gold dome mosque that's very famous, the Imam Ali Shrine. And so, number one, I said, I don't even want to see a nick out of the gold dome shrine. I don't care if they shoot at us directly from it. We have to figure out how not to do any damage to that at all. We must show our awareness of the sensitivity yeah. of that particular site. Uh, but beyond that, I said, look, when the very first infantryman, the first point man makes contact with the enemy, I want to have it arrayed all the way back. I want that point man to have a battle buddy watching him. I want that fire team to have a fire team watching them. Squad watching the squad, platoon, company, battalion. And then over their shoulders directly, I want light attack helicopters because they can sort of flutter up there. Back a bit more, I want the heavy attack helicopters, the Apaches. Uh, mm -hmm. Overhead, I want circling the fast movers. Having already dropped, I think we dropped 30 or 40 precision munitions uh, in the early morning hours before that very first uh, attack. I want the medical evacuation sitting there with the blades turning already. I want fuel pushed up as far uh, as close to the battle as we can. I want, uh, again, the frontline ambulances. We, we want the refuel and rearm for our helicopters at, up as close as we can do it. Uh, all the communications redundant. It, so again, you set everything up so that when that first person makes contact, you can just unleash everything that you need to or not. Yeah, like, yeah. Have it all available. It's not that you're exploring, oh gosh, where are the, do we have the mortars? Yeah, where are the, and I forgot to mention the light mortars, the heavy mortars, the 105 howitzers, the 155 millimeter howitzers and so forth. And all of that, and, and if you can register it in advance on some uh, target, you know, what is, what are they going to be laid on at the time? I mean, you just dig into the details for all of this. Yeah. And that's the job of a commander. Uh, so that when that lone individual makes contact with the enemy, everybody's got his back. Yeah. Uh, and now, of course, in the infantry, it could be her back as well, because women have earned the right, if they meet the physical requirements, uh, to serve in our infantry, and indeed, a number of women have even completed the Ranger School, uh, which is arguably in in the Army the most challenging physical course. Oh, that's great. And so, um, you know, this is something that's so fascinating. Uh, a lot of you know, obviously, I find it challenging to manage a, a small business. But how, like, what is what is the uh, how did you build up that mental uh, sort of strength to manage a war where, as you said, you know. It's not even about the uh, about the property, but it it, it has uh, hundreds of thousands of lives at stake. How did you make uh, decisions without um, you know getting bogged down by that 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 weight on your shoulders? Well, first of all, you know you should recognize that there are thousands, tens of thousands of great soldiers, sailors, yeah. airmen, Marines, Coast Guardsmen, even civilians. Yeah, helping yeah. carry the rucksack of the commander, if you will, in a sense, rhetorically speaking. Yeah, yeah. Uh, number two, you spent your entire life leading up to this moment and, and ensuring that you have the physical endurance, the mental toughness, uh, the resilience, if you will. Uh, all of these qualities have to be there, but it's far more than that. I mean, you have to obviously perform the four tasks of a leader correctly and those are to get the big ideas right to communicate them effectively through the breadth and depth of the organization and you have huge staffs and all kinds of mechanisms for doing that uh you oversee the implementation of the big ideas and again you have every single morning there's a battlefield update and analysis and a whole battle rhythm that goes through every day every week every month up to the quarterly command uh review together with the ambassador um and then you've got to determine, usually formally, you have to sit down with your lessons learned teams and all the commanders and everybody else periodically and, and require 
a discussion of how do we need to refine the big ideas so that we can do it again and again and again. And in the case of the surge in Iraq, for example, I mean, the big ideas were pretty profound. Uh, these were essentially reversing by 180 degrees what it was that we've been doing before. We've been consolidating on big bases, uh, handing off to the Iraqis, and it turned out tragically that that was premature and that we needed to go back into the neighborhoods that the only way we could secure the people, which was job one, was to live with them and to take back control of the security responsibilities in those areas so that in many cases we could pull the Iraqi units off uh, out of combat and reconstitute them. In other words, fill them back up with people, equipment, vehicles, uh, retraining uh, leaders and so forth, and then reintroduce them uh, in, into their combat roles. Uh, and then another huge idea that you can't kill or capture your way out of an industrial strength insurgency. You have to, you have to reconcile with as many of the rank and file of the enemy as you can, while you intensify the effort to capture or, if necessary, kill the irreconcilables, the leaders of Al Qaeda in Iraq, mm -hmm. uh, the leaders of the uh, major Sunni Arab insurgent groups, and the major Shia militia supported by Iran, and so forth. But you got to get those big ideas right. Had we had the extra 25 or 30,000 troops, uh, which people normally think of when they think of the surge, uh, and just continued to execute what we'd been doing, we would in no way have been able to drive violence down by 85 or 90 percent, which is what we accomplished. Yeah, yeah. But that was because we changed the entire strategy. We changed the entire approach. So the big ideas were completely transformed. Uh, in fact, I've often said that the surge that mattered most was not the surge of forces, it was the surge of ideas, again, the change in strategy. You are listening to Bootstrapping Your Dream Show with Manu Jagarwal. Businesses face numerous challenges like finding the right product market fit, determining the market size, implementing a winning go-to-market strategy, crafting customer-centric USP, competitive analysis, looking for funding, building up cash flow and profitability. We have made a lot of free resources available to the entrepreneurial community, including this podcast. this podcast. We invite you to check out our websites and follow us on social channels. The links are in the show notes. We hope you find the resources useful and utilize them to grow your business. Grow your business. We also have some programs for entrepreneurs. If you find our content useful, then you will definitely find the programs outstanding so do check them out you have seen humanity from you know various different perspectives that most people don't get to see um you know in, in we talk about peace and social conflict and many other ideas um so from your experiences do you think uh, these type of conflicts are necessary like do you think there's going to be a time in uh, humanity's life where we may not have any war or maybe even the war that is carried on is bloodless. Well, you would certainly hope so. Uh, and the, the element within me that is a rational optimist, in other words, it's not just an out and out optimist, it's an optimist founded on some rational thinking. Uh, uh, even though when I was the commander in Iraq, I would say I'm neither an optimist nor a pessimist. I'm a realist and reality in Iraq is that it's all hard all the time and so mm -hmm. forth. Um, I, the optimist in me, uh, again, would hope that we could reach a point where you can resolve differences with other than kinetic conflict, if you will. And the truth is actually, perhaps just because of the concerns of a escalation to nuclear warfare, but in the wake of World War II, there have not been any kinds of those global conflagrations uh, of which we saw two just in the 20th century alone and in, in history full of them prior to that. So again, one hopes that that could certainly be a cautionary experience uh, and that frankly, our challenges in Iraq and Afghanistan and a variety of other places as well. Um, look at Libya, look at Syria, look at some others that again, not just, again, the United States, but the other parties to these conflicts recognize that perhaps it's better not to head down that road if you yeah. can, obviously, if and only if um, you can uh, preempt it through some kind of, as always, dialogue, discussion, debate, argument, what have you, 
but short of of going to war. Yeah. Um, the realist in me, however, cautions that uh, there are plenty of examples around the world right now where dialogue and argument and discussion have not been enough. Uh, mm -hmm. There are many uh, examples of irregular warfare uh, around the world. Uh, there are certainly plenty of cases in which Islamist extremists are still trying to carry out uh, a variety of different attacks on people and countries that they're trying to gain some degree of control over or uh, persuade to see the world through the prism of their extreme yeah, yeah. vision. Uh, and there obviously is a resumption of great power rivalries as the US national security strategy describes it. And that is very concerning um, because again, if nothing else, it just raises the possibility of miscalculation that could spiral into something that is incredibly damaging. When you think of the capacity of war making systems, even without employing nuclear weapons, uh, it is very, very considerable. But, would, but again, what does what do you do if you cannot achieve something that is truly yeah. critical in the minds of the policymakers, um, especially if it involves a nation getting a nuclear weapon and you don't trust that nation uh, and you're very concerned about its intentions if it has a weapon of mass destruction. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's a pretty, pretty sobering yeah. prospect. For sure. And I was watching one of your interviews and um, where uh, it, you know, you were emphasizing the need to leverage technology, AI. So uh, that's what I also meant. Like, do you, maybe the conflict will stay, but the nature of conflict which will change to more sort of cyber wars. Uh, those, like, do you see that coming? Happen? <clears throat> well, clearly cyberspace is a new entire domain of warfare without mm -hmm. question. Yeah. And so we see that and, and it's actually it seems to be sort of below the threshold of kinetic activity because it is ongoing all the time and we yeah, don't yeah. respond to it generally, not kinetically. We tend yeah. to respond with sanctions, with legal activities, um, with uh, trade restrictions, diplomatic uh, actions, uh, visa revocations, you know, you name it, uh, yeah. travel restrictions and so forth, naming and shaming, rather than actually carrying out some kind of uh, physical destructive action. Uh, that's going on all the time. And clearly any conflict in the future, uh, even irregular warfare is going to include activities in the new domain of warfare that is cyberspace. If you think about what it was that distinguished the Islamic State, for example, it wasn't just that they established a caliphate on the ground, a very substantial one, uh, including parts of, of Syria and Iraq. Uh, it was also that they established uh, a caliphate in cyberspace, a virtual caliphate, if you will. Uh, and that, that caliphate was very effective in recruiting individuals to their cause uh, promoting this very twisted vision of, of Islam, very extreme version uh, of Islam, uh, motivating individuals to take, carry out attacks elsewhere in the world uh, and, and so forth. And so that is an element of warfare with which we have to contend now really all the time and against which it's very hard to deploy effective remedies. This, this so-called countering violent extremism, CVE programs. Uh, we had a very substantial one at US Central Command when I was the commander there and a fairly costly one. And it's still so difficult that, you know, how do you quantify uh, individuals who don't go down the road of extremism because there was another voice uh, in that area of cyberspace of the internet Mm -hmm. uh, to counter again what the violent extremists were propagating. Again, it's very, very difficult to develop metrics that show you whether you're winning or losing, making progress or, or not. Yet it has to be done. Yeah. And then you have, of course, the increasing use of unmanned systems. Uh, unmanned aerial vehicles have truly transformed how we are able to uh, support host nation forces on the ground. Keep in mind that the Islamic State was, as an army at least, was defeated 
by Iraqi and Syrian forces on the ground. Uh, they were advised, trained, equipped, assisted, and enabled by the U.S. And, and a coalition against the Islamic State, the most important element of which might have been the, the predators and reaper drones uh, that are orbiting yeah, yeah. seven days a week, 24 hours a day over likely areas of the enemy. And when the enemy pops up on a rooftop or in a street or wherever, uh, that that enemy is, if, if it can be seen, it can be hit, yeah, yeah. Uh, is the saying. And this provided an all-seeing eye, uh, an unblinking eye, uh, over parts of the battlefield that provided enormous assistance uh, to those who were fighting on the ground. And of course, it was also augmented by manned aircraft, uh, by intelligence gathering systems, by precision strike munitions from manned and unmanned systems, yeah. and so forth. And then there is the advent, of course, of, of, of robots on the battlefield. Yeah. And it's, it's not inconceivable that there will be robots fighting robots. And, you know, whoever has the best algorithm or the best, I don't know, uh, intelligence surveillance detection systems uh, networked into them, uh, that will determine the outcome. And, you know, this is going to prevent present some very fundamental ethical challenges because we all respond that the person must be in the loop. Yeah. Uh, you shouldn't get into this where it's just the machine again deciding that it can take a life or take a robot. Um, but if you actually keep the person in the loop in the normal way that that is construed, your machine's going to lose because no person is going to be fast enough to beat an algorithm that's running the enemy system if it's a near peer competitor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and so it may be that we have to shift our mindset and the person is in the loop uh, in the making of the algorithm uh, that actually guides this particular, and it can be very restrictive. I mean, you can yeah. say as an example, you must have 99.9% .9 certainty that it is in, I don't know, again, yeah. the enemy person or an enemy system. Uh, there can be 99. 9% certainty that there are no civilians in the area. Um, you can have facial recognition, gate recognition. There's any number of different, and, and there should be some other perhaps boxes checked that humans might actually confirm. But once they're actually on the battlefield, it's going to be the algorithm against the other algorithm. Yeah. Again, this is not fanciful, I don't think. I think we will see this coming soon to a battlefield near us in in the years that lie ahead, not the decades that lie ahead. I do agree. I do agree. Um, but I think uh, the good thing is that uh, um, at least we are moving towards less casualties and uh, less less uh, bloodshed, hopefully. Well, I think that is true. Um, although there have been terrible uh, civilian losses uh, in Afghanistan, for example. Uh, the civilian carnage is the only way to describe uh, what has happened in Syria, where fully half of the Syrian population has been displaced uh, from uh, their homes, mm -hmm. and half of those displaced have been displaced outside the country. Uh -huh. uh, and the loss of life, I think the United Nations essentially stopped counting at 500,000 or some just astonishing, terrible, uh -huh. tragic number. So there has been terrible loss of life in some of these conflicts, but certainly we have figured out how to at least reduce the number of casualties um, for those who are engaged in that direct combat, um, comparing the losses, every one tragic, but comparing those in Iraq and Afghanistan to those the vastly higher in Vietnam, Korea, not to mention World War II. For sure. Um, now, I know, uh, are, are we good for a couple of more questions in terms of time? Um, so I wanted to ask you uh, 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 your experience going from the military to the private sector. And obviously, you know, we are going through a transition period uh, due, due to the pandemic and, you know, the socially distant economy and everything. Um, what are some of the things that you can share what you what you have learned in the private sector versus the military? And uh, moving forward, uh, how do you think this socially distant economy is going to affect business? Well, let me start with the second one first, and then you can re-ask the, the first yeah. one. Because I think the big idea that is emerging about life after the pandemic, 
In other words, life once every one of us has had uh, two inoculations with the vaccine that works to a sufficiently high level that we're no longer concerned about exposure in public places uh, and therapeutics that are so good that even if you get the, the virus, it's no big deal. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and no one knows how far off that is, but that day will come presumably. But I think it would be it would be foolish to think that the new normal, the post pandemic normal is just going to be returned to the old normal. I think we, we truly will have changed how we work, uh, how we live, uh, how we socialize, how we play and all the rest of that. And some of these I think will have uh, really lasting consequences. Um, again, it's very hard to tell how significant that difference will be. Uh, but it's hard for me to imagine that some of the industries and sectors that have been hurt most grievously, that they're going to bounce back the entire way. I, I'm, it, at the very least, that will take quite a considerable amount of time. Yeah. And whether certain sectors will bounce back, our office uh, real estate sectors in the major metropolitan areas truly going to come back to what they were, or are we going to do more of what it is that we're doing right now? Is business travel truly going to be as crazy as what I used to be engaged in in the, you know, seven and a half years since I left government? Um, I don't think so, actually. I mean, I, I really will resist these nutty ideas that we used to have that, you know, you could first you take the train to New York, then you work all day in New York, even through a dinner, then you race to Kennedy International Airport, you fly to London, you race to a hotel, you take a shower, change, do a meeting and a lunch. Mm -hmm. uh, race to Heathrow so you can get back to New York to do a meeting after dinner. I mean, this is crazy. Yeah, and with, uh, again, the advent of, of much simpler uh, and very easy to use just again on an iPad or a laptop or even an iPhone kinds of systems, Zoom and MS Teams and WebEx and so forth, um, I really wonder if conferences in the future aren't going to be hybrid. Certainly yeah. there will be some that would like to go to that location and want to sit down with people and feel that it's really irreplaceable to developing the kinds of relationships that are necessary to do business together. Although we are proving that that is not necessary in, in KKR, it's desirable, but we have invested enormous sums of money in companies without the kind of you know, personal sit downs uh, that were characteristic of the process of diligence in the past. So again, I think there will be real lasting differences. I, I don't think that business travel is going to come fully back uh, right away. Tourism may, there will be a lot of pent up demand, I think for all of us to see the world again and, and to see what has transpired. But again, there are gonna be many, many sectors that is going to take a real period of time to rebuild. Yeah, uh, yeah. What will it take to rebuild the restaurant sector again in San Francisco and and New York, as an example, or Chicago, the really, you know, the vertical cities yeah. that um, there's just no way they can survive, certainly with any kind of social distancing, not certainly the way they were before. Yeah. Um, and again, the hospitality space, the tourism space, again, how long does it take for that to come back? I mean, when will people embrace going on cruise lines again, um, yeah. given that the experiences that they've had with them. Again, those days may arrive, there will be safeguards, there will be measures to mitigate uh, much better than in the past, but it's going to take a considerable amount of time, I think. And, you know, for those who are entering the workforce, and I've done events just in recent days for those who call themselves the unlucky class of 2020. Yeah. Um, and, you know, my definition of luck is that it's what happens when preparation meets opportunity, but they rightly said, well, look, we were preparing for opportunities that are very different from what are out there right now. So clearly adjustment has to be made because there are sectors that have boomed yeah. during this period. Mm -hmm. uh, there are industries that have uh, sustained enormous growth. Uh, this has been a catalytic effect for them and then others that have really been leveled uh, or cut off at the knees. So, and now you can ask the first question so that yeah, the audience will that. remember it as I, well. I just want to make sure we have enough time because I also want to talk about your uh, charities and causes. So one question was um, any any major uh, sort of differences you notice between the private sector and the military and any lessons you can share yeah. with all the entrepreneurs? Yeah. Um, look, first of all, I think for 
those who serve in the military, it is very difficult to take the uniform off for the last time because when you do, you are giving up three really important elements of your life. You're giving up a mission that is larger than self. You're giving up a community uh, with which you perform those missions filled with others who feel the same way about the uh, privilege and honor to perform a mission that's larger than self and of consequence to our country. And then you're actually removing your identity. I mean, if you think about somebody who was in the army as long as I was and all the things that you've got all over the place, yeah, yeah. Um, you can literally read your career in the ribbons. I mean, I can actually look at someone's ribbons and almost tell them, you know, the story of their professional career. Yeah, yeah. Um, we know what unit they served in combat with. We know how long they were in combat. We know the unit they're in now. Uh, we know the different schools and badges that they've uh, mm -hmm. achieved and all the rest of this. And you take it all off um, and you put on this nondescript, um, you know, civilian suit, I guess. Uh, and, and it's quite different. Yeah, for sure. Having said that, what I have been found is number one, you, there are wonderfully intellectually stimulating endeavors to pursue. Uh, there are rewards uh, that are also uh, wonderful as well. And I'm not just talking about compensation. I'm talking about just being engaged in very important uh, endeavors. Um, I really believe in what we do at, at KKR at the private equity, now really a global fully in investment firm in all respects. Yeah. Uh, you know, that taking people's pension funds, investing them in companies, giving back more to the pension funds, having helped those companies grow, building value. Uh, we can lay these talents on top of them and all the rest. Uh, that's a pretty rewarding endeavor. Um, and in our industrial group where they give stock to the employees, I mean, it's it's magical to watch what happens when individuals working uh, in some industry manufacturing, let's say, uh, and all of a sudden they're stockholders. They actually own a piece of the company to which they've devoted their lives. It's That's a pretty yeah. profound moment and a very emotional one for many of them. But in any event, this is, again, this is exciting stuff as well. I remember, you know, I was really excited about a, we owned the biggest rose growing firm, cut rose firm in the world in Ethiopia. Oh, wow. And I think my West Point classmates heard that, you know, Petraeus is excited about investing in roses in <laughs> Ethiopia and thought I'd lost my mind. But look, it, it started out with 9,000 employees and we grew it by 3,000 more. Wow. Uh, it was one of the biggest private enterprises uh, in all of Ethiopia. We sent a fully loaded 747 jet uh, every night from Addis Ababa to Amsterdam. Uh, with roses for the cut flower markets. Again, this is actually exciting stuff. We had free health care for the workers, education for their kids. We even made a soccer team and built a field for them to play on. I mean, um, it, again, that's really, uh, this is, it's like nation building in a place yeah. where you're actually helping the nation rebuild after conflict. Yeah. So anyway, I mean, again, th this is very rewarding, but it's the intellectual stimulation. It's the opportunity to to meet uh, other people. It's the recognition that there, again, are really seriously bright folks in many of the sectors of, uh, again, of, of the business world. And the one I'm in is among, among the most competitive. I'd argue that in startups uh, and, uh, yeah. and also to help startups. And I invest in startups. That's exciting. Young leaders with big ideas and can they scale them and make a go of them? Uh, not to mention then nonprofits. So I'm on the board of a dozen veterans organizations and then several think tanks, various roles in some of those uh, think tanks. And again, that's also uh, great. And then, you know, we have, as of this morning, a second grand grandchild and, oh, congratulations. Uh, and family and, and friends and all the rest that, you know, I, look, I was deployed for over seven of my last 10 years in uniform. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, heck, it's just sort of nice to be home for dinner. Now, actually, we've been home for dinner so much in the last <laughs> seven months that we're probably more than ready to go out. Um, we've more than made up for the deficit yeah, for the final sure. seven years. Um, but again, all of that is really quite special. Heck, I mean, just the fact that I've got right here my Zoom companion. I don't yeah. know if you can quite see her. 
Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> can you see a dog there? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Not, yeah. not quite very vigilant. <laughs> Police the per perimeter right now, but you know she's waiting for her next walk and yeah, you know, yeah. listen to podcasts. I think one of the great joys in life actually is is having a nice walk on a brisk afternoon with a sure, you know, sure. man's best friend. So there's a lot of blessings in life, uh, even at a time when you know you can't go out and do what it was that we used to love to do um, and have to live with a lot of restrictions, but which we need to do uh, to ensure that we're looking out not just for ourselves but for our fellow citizens as well that's well said yeah that's well said uh and lastly i would love to, you know you you've been uh you have had such an impact on on i will say i mean the, the whole human race like you you are in history books so um after you know after the military kkr you're also involved in some other um causes i would love to get uh you know a few names of the causes that you are most passionate about and uh, what can we do to move that cause forward? Well, there's one that is uh, called Children of Fallen Patriots. My wife is the one who's actually on the board of that, but I support it very, mm -hmm. uh, very heavily and been very active with it. Uh, and this ensures that those who are the children of those in uniform who are killed in the line of duty, many obviously in combat, but not just strictly combat, uh, it could be a training accident as well, uh, that we will ensure that their children can go to college and we'll pay for it uh, and uh, for a variety of associated expenses. And that's a pretty awesome yeah, for sure. thing to watch and to listen, you know, the testimony from the hundreds, thousands of students that have been helped uh, and actually to talk to a family. I mean, occasionally we've encountered people and they said, by the way, do you know that Children of Fallen Patriots will pay your son or daughter's way through college. You know, they've been talking about how they've been really trying to save and to do this and to do that. It's been tough, obviously, since yeah. um, the mother or father was killed. Yeah. Um, again, that's a, an extraordinary cause. Uh, no One Left Behind is another organization where we're seeking to help the battlefield translators, the host nation battlefield translators from Afghanistan and Iraq in particular, who served many years on the battlefield. You know, our, our son served out there. He was a platoon leader. He had an Afghan translator with him mm -hmm. uh, almost all the time. Uh, he left, of course, at a certain point in time, his tour was up. The Afghan translator stayed and he stayed on and on and on. I mean, there, I know of one who actually did the equivalent of 12 consecutive tours wow. in combat. And we have then you know, their actions have jeopardized their own safety and security. The know. Taliban gradually find out who they are. They go after their family. They go after them. And we have to take care of them. In the right. same way that we have to take care of our own veterans, we have to look after those who fought shoulder to shoulder with our men and women in combat uh, on these battlefields. Uh, the Iraq Afghanistan Veterans of America uh, is a wonderful organization. It's the most effective advocacy organization uh, I think for uh, those who have served in Iraq and Afghanistan and during that period, the Wounded Warrior uh, Program is another wonderful organization and a very close friend uh, who was one of our brigade commanders during the fight to Baghdad. One of those main effort brigade commanders, uh, retired three star now, is the, the head of that. And again, this number can go on. Uh, yeah, Team yeah. Rubicon, which its mission is to serve veterans by serving others. So veterans come together in the wake of natural disasters and and just go in and help people in ways that, you know, strong, able-bodied uh, former military members can do and also with some very special skills and now also the ability to actually be the on-site manager for FEMA and a variety of other additional capabilities and, and heavy moving equipment and all the rest of that. But again, there, there are numerous organizations like this, which can enable uh, our veterans to, in many respects, have that mission that is larger than self, even after you take off the uniform, to have a community yeah. with which to perform that mission. And in some cases, even to have the identity because you have a Team Rubicon yeah, t-shirt yeah. yeah. uh, or some other identifying paraphernalia. Yeah. Uh, for the organization. And then there are think tanks and there is the the uh, Institute for the Study of War, which very kindly is establishing a, 
a Petraeus Center within it for development of uh, uh, future talent. Uh, you know, I was fairly well known for identifying really talented people and then trying to get them to work for me. And again and again and again, I mean, there were a few that did not just one or two tours, but actually three or four yeah. uh, tours with me over the years in combat. Mm -hmm. Uh, and and this would try to do that uh, for those who are studying in academic fields that will uh, enable them to be the security analyst, analysts and thinkers and strategists and so forth on Capitol Hill uh, in the executive branch departments and all the rest. But there and there's many more that yeah. you mentioned the fellowship at Yale, which is great fun. Uh, these other academic appointments that I've had uh, over the years, six years at Harvard and the University of Southern California fellow and a Judge Whitney professor, those, they're terrific because you get to have relationships that stay active, uh, again, with younger folks um, who always have such a, an enthusiastic and energetic uh, and frankly optimistic approach to life, even in times like these, because all of these activities right now I'm doing virtually, yeah, yeah. Uh, and yet they are still, uh, again, very enjoyable and 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 again very stimulating. And that's I think what you're looking yeah. for. And at least I I have been in life after government. That's great. And thank you so much. Uh, you know, this has been a dream come true having a conversation with you and uh, you giving us uh, being so gracious and giving us your time. Uh, and I will definitely put the links to the organizations that you mentioned in the show. That would be great. Thank yeah. you so much. Really yeah. good to be with you. Thanks Thank for hosting. You so much. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Pleasure is mine. Great topic of the day. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Thanks for tuning in to Bootstrapping Your Dreams. Bootstrapping Your Dreams. We bring you life-changing insights about starting and growing your business, making your life and family happy. Given the fact that you listened to the whole episode, we know you are an awesome fan. awesome fan. So why not help us spread the message? Please share the podcast with others who can benefit from it. And if you are feeling extra generous, leave a review on iTunes or any other platform where you are listening to the podcast.